Welcome to a very special segment of Dialogue on Public Issues. I'm John Chowning with Campbellsville University. Very pleased to be interviewing today as my guest, the Honorable Jacqueline Coleman, Kentucky Lieutenant Governor. Welcome, Governor Coleman. Thank you so much for having me, Dr. Chowning. We are honored to have you. I know you have a very busy schedule during this very uh, busy time. I think uh, Kentuckians are, are familiar with you, but uh, tell us a little bit about your background prior to uh, running for office and, and being a part of this administration. Okay, well, um, I am uh, Kentucky through and through. I was born in the big city of Bergen. Mm. Uh, which has a four-way stop, and that's about it. Um, and grew up there, a graduate of Mercer County High School. Um, I went on to uh, Center College and um, got a master's degree at the University of Louisville. And to keep things balanced, I am working on my doctorate at the University of Kentucky. Oh. Uh, yeah, currently. Um, started that back in 2016. So um, that's been that's been. Uh, very eye-opening as well. Um, I've spent my life in the classroom and on the basketball court. I um, was a high school government teacher uh, and uh, coached basketball for about 12 years, which is how I met my husband. He also coached basketball. Um, and uh, together we uh, have a blended family. So I started out with, I call them my bonus sons, uh, Will and Nate, who are, Will is now 19 and Nate is uh, 17, 18 actually, he's 18 now. He just had a birthday. Um, along the way, we adopted um, a young lady named Emma who played basketball for me. Um, and she is uh, 22 right now and um, got a big surprise during the campaign and uh, found out I was expecting. And so we have a five month old named. Congratulations. Ev Thank you. So that's a big, big range, uh, a big blended family. Um, mm -hmm. But it's that's that's uh, basically uh, who I am and where I'm from and who I love. I think you and I have uh, in common one college that we both attended. Okay. You didn't mention it, Lindsey Wilson College. Yes, I did go to Lindsey Wilson uh, at the beginning uh, and then transferred to Center. Yeah. Center. I, I was a Lindsey Wilson student uh, when it was a junior college, met my wife there, and then went okay. to Transylvania, where okay. I received my bachelor's degree. So you are very familiar with Kentucky's private colleges. I am. And uh, the Association of Independent Kentucky Colleges and Universities, I know. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and and uh, will you wear, once you get your doctorate finished, will you wear a red and blue uh, coat or jacket or whatever at uh, a basketball game? Right. Well, so this is the truth. And I've always believed this. My grandfather um, it was uh, UofL's very first thousand point scorer. Wow. He played football, basketball, and baseball at UofL and got drafted professionally to play basketball. So he's a professional basketball player, but we grew up close to Lexington. Mm -hmm. So I grew up watching UK basketball too. And so I honestly cheer for both teams. Um, and my husband says he'll cheer for both teams as long as UK's not playing UofL. My question was in the tradition of the uh, former Governor John Y. Brown back right, in the 80s right. when he was governor and yeah. the two teams played each other. He wore a half blue and half red jacket that I will always remember as a That's classic right. for the Kentucky Louisville uh, rivalry. Now, why did you accept the invitation by Governor Bashir to become his running mate? Well, you know, I, I um, had known um, the governor, I call him Andy, I'm going to call him Andy, um, uh, because of the work that he did as attorney general. And, uh, you know, I believed in the work that he did as AG. Um, he often talked about he felt the, uh, the call to fight for the lost, the lonely and the left behind. And uh, he certainly did that as attorney general. Um, through everything from the dr fighting the drug epidemic to protecting uh, survivors of um, domestic violence and sexual assault uh, to public education and defending uh, public education. And so, um, you know, I believed in his work doing that um, and I thought he would be a great governor and uh, wanted to be able to help in some way um, if I could to, to be able to make that happen. And so, you know, I think what what kind of brought us together was the fact that he was pretty much the tip of the spear um, when it came to defending public education as our attorney general um, 
and I was a, a classroom teacher who was very vocal um, about the need uh, and the importance of education across across all spectrums, um, and that's P20. Um, so, so often we think, uh, I think we have our conversations about K12 and P20 is, is where we should be heading with the continuum of education. And so, um, you know, I think we, that brought us together, but I think what made us a great team was we share the same um, ideals, but we have very different professional experiences. So where I spent my life in the classroom, he spent his time as an attorney and of course, eventually as attorney general. And so those two different professional perspectives, I believe, help us to be able to come together and to piece our policies together to consider different angles and perspectives. And that is something that we don't see enough of um, in the policy world anymore. And so um, I really enjoyed that opportunity to be able to work with him on that. I have made the observation to a few people here in Campbellsville and on the Campbellsville University campus that you may be, uh, you were a candidate of consequence. I think you made a difference in the uh, uh, can, uh, can away from uh, Governor Bashir. And I think you have the potential, uh, the Lieutenant Governor of most consequence, uh, at least in the last, uh, since the Governor and Lieutenant Governor began running as a team. Uh, what is your role uh, in the administration uh, in, in the what uh, did you and uh, Governor Bashir discuss uh, during the campaign, and and what do you see as your your vital role in this administration? Well, first, let, let me say thank you for that. Um, I take that as a, as a compliment, um, it, and, it and, po and, possi and possibly a burden. I don't know. We'll see, um, but okay. certainly a compliment. Uh, so, you know, when um, we first started having this discussion, uh, you know, I, I said to him. I want to be in a position where I can make a difference and I want to be I want to play an active role in your administration. I will do whatever I can, you know, to, to help move our policies forward. Uh, but I need that opportunity. And I and I very frankly said to him because we can have these conversations. And I, I said, if, if you don't see that uh, for mm -hmm. your lieutenant governor, then I need to keep being an assistant principal because I know I can make a difference every day there. And his response to me was, if I didn't want an active lieutenant governor, I wouldn't be talking to you. So uh, that was a very, very early understanding and, uh, and pretty much the what sums up our, our um, professional relationship. Um, and so I wear several hats um, in the administration. Uh, you know, as the lieutenant governor, I am in um, every conversation from COVID, which is not even a conversation we knew we would have to have right. <laughs> when we were elected. Um, exactly. To yeah, it, it's it's just been it, it's really been incredible. Um, it, you know, whether it's boards and commissions. Um, our senior staff, our cabinet secretary meetings, all of those I'm involved in um, behind the scenes. Uh, my Probably my most visible role um, in the administration is uh, serving as the secretary of education and workforce development. Uh, Lieutenant Governor, you and uh, Governor Bashir have certainly been faced with uh, some major challenges during your six or seven months in office. Uh, state budget concerns, obviously the COVID-19 pandemic that no one obviously could have ever predicted, uh, the rightful outcries and protests resulting from the violent deaths of Breonna Taylor in Louisville and uh, George Floyd and others. Uh, what have been the major public policy initiatives of your administration in regard to these challenges? And certainly I'm throwing a lot at you in one single question. <laughs> But uh, uh, please uh, discuss it. We can start with COVID-19. OK, uh, and you're and you're right. Uh, when, when the governor and I began running, it was 2018. But I say even, you know, the day that we were sworn into office on December 10th had no concept uh, of what was coming with COVID-19. And so it really has been a whirlwind of the first six months in office, uh, that is for sure. And so one of the questions I get is, you know, how did uh, this pandemic derail your policy efforts. And so 
one thing I like to make sure that people know is is uh, when we first were elected, we we created the acronym WHERE uh, as, a, as a question of where are we going? Where do we want to be as a state? And the W stood for wages. We want to make sure that families, uh, that it, when you work uh, one job, you can raise a family on that one job, a good paying job. Um, the uh, the um, H is for healthcare because we want to make sure very simply that when you're sick, you can see a doctor. The first E stood for education because education is the foundation of the future of this Commonwealth. Uh, we cannot have a conversation about economic development or job creation without first having a conversation about education. And that's P20. That's not just K12. That is the continuum of our education uh, system here in Kentucky. Uh, the R stood for retirements uh, because we want to make sure that regardless of, of how you serve the Commonwealth, whether it's um, in as a state employee, as a, as a public school teacher, as a law enforcement uh, folks, uh, social workers, that all of those folks get the retirement that they have been promised because they've worked very hard to serve this uh, Commonwealth and it's the least we can do to keep that promise to them. And the last E stood for example. And uh, the reason that we wanted to focus on that is because it's very easy to get uh, tied up in the partisan politics squabbles and go down that black hole uh, that uh, means that you really throw away any opportunity to have uh, meaningful conversations um, at that point. And so our goal is to be an example, to lead by example, uh, to avoid that partisan political back and forth as much as possible. There are some places that we will we will just disagree on policy uh, mm -hmm. with with different folks. And when we do, we do. But we have to do it in in a respectful way so that when we do agree, we can both come back to the table and get things done for Kentuckians. Uh, and so, you know, that was the that was uh, the initial uh, focus of our administration, and so I would tell you that through COVID nineteen, those are still our focus points. We're still worried about wages. We're still focused on health care more now than before. Um, education is a priority. Retirements are increasingly important uh, given our economic situation right now. And leading by example in the middle of uh, you know a pandemic is is truly critical. So. Those are still our focus points. We're just dealing with them from a very different perspective than we thought we would be in the beginning. Going forward with regard to COVID-19, uh, what do you think will be some of the initiatives or efforts on the part of the administration to try to contain the numbers as much as you can? Well, so there, uh, you know, there's lots of different um, uh, uh, goals that we have here. The first, we have to educate. We have to make sure people understand um, that this is real, that it affects everyone. Uh, no one is is immune to this. And even if you are a young person who is asymptomatic, we still don't know what the long term effects of contracting the virus might be for you down the road. And so these are all really important um, points that we have to make to folks. Uh, we also have to educate the public about ways to mitigate this uh, virus and that the number one way is to wear a mask when you are in when you are in public or when you are um, in motion in in uh, your office space or buildings uh, that is the number one way to protect yourself and to protect others um, and so that has to be a priority um, we talked about um, you know the different ways that we can help prevent this and so uh, we continue to do the weekly um, press conferences to update Kentuckians on where we are with numbers to give them new information um, and to remind them of old information because we have to continue to focus on those things. But the biggest thing, if we want to look at reopening the economy and keeping it open, if we want to look at reopening school buildings and college campuses and keeping them open, uh, we have to have Kentuckians who are committed to doing what we have to do to mitigate this virus. I mean, thank goodness that Kentucky is where it is and we're not Florida or Texas or Arizona because those states are just absolutely exploding with numbers. But to me, any death is one too many for yeah. a Kentucky family when we could be preventing this in these very simple ways that are of service to everyone around us. I might add the medical uh, community and, and medical science is now telling us not only do the mask help uh, protect other people, it also is they're now telling us it reduces our chances of getting COVID from someone else 
I've heard as high as 60 plus percent. Right. So there, there, there is a dual purpose in wearing a mask. There, there absolutely is. And, you know, uh, the history teacher in me has to say that as I taught my students about the greatest generation, mm-hmm. right, and the, and the sacrifices that were made by, it was my grandparents' generation um, that saved America, that saved the world. I think about that, and I think surely to goodness we can put a piece of cloth across our face and not complain about it, right? I mean, that well, is sac- very small sacrifice to make. You... Uh, uh- also, I mentioned uh, the, the concerns about social justice, racial justice, and inequities. I know that during all the COVID-19 uh, situations, uh, the, this administration has also uh, stepped forward in addressing some of those issues, including the health disparities. Would you uh, want to comment on that, please? Yes. So um, through the, the pandemic, we have... Uh, this is what I say about it. It has created new challenges, but it has certainly compounded old ones. And one of the old challenges that we are confronted with through this is the disparities in our healthcare system. Mm-hmm. Um, COVID-19 affects, uh, negatively impacts uh, the African-American community at a much higher rate um, than than others. And that goes back generations of uh, lack of, of good health care access and and opportunities. And so the governor uh, committed to make sure that uh, providing access to health care for African Americans would be a priority in Kentucky. That doesn't mean that one community receives something that another community doesn't. It just means that we have to make sure that we prioritize the folks who have been uh, marginalized in the past because we've got to make sure that we protect every Kentuckian and every Kentuckian has access to that health care that they need. You uh, are working, as you mentioned earlier, a secretary, part of your portfolio, primary part, is secretary of the Education and Workforce Development Cabinet. What are some of your primary goals in that particular role and new initiatives that you and your team may be pursuing? Well, so, uh, my one of my first goals was to ensure that I call it shattering silos. I want to shatter the silos that exist in education, in state government, and bring the parties together that uh, can help and be more efficient and effective. Uh, and so my goal is to create what I call a cradle to career cabinet, where we talk about everything from childcare and early childhood through uh, elementary and secondary schools into uh, higher ed. Um, and post and post secondary life, whatever that looks like for different folks, um, and and uh, I call the way that we want to do that. I call it the the four E's of education and workforce development. And the first E is for expanding early childhood access. Uh, we know the data shows that there is uh, there is no question that early childhood education has a huge impact um, on our kids, especially uh, kids from uh, communities in need, uh, and it has a um, massive impact on literacy rates, Mm. which compounds over a child's lifetime and ultimately impacts our economy, right? I mean, that is an economic workforce development issue, even though it's talked about as education. So the first is expanding access to early childhood education. Uh, The second is when we jump into middle school, I want to make sure that we create exposure for our middle school kids to the opportunities that exist in their communities. So oftentimes our kids are are, um, in a point where they start to think about what they might wanna be when they grow up or where they might wanna work or those those decisions start to flow. And the reality is is that by the time they get to that point, they they really don't understand what exists in their own community. And so in middle school, I want to make sure that we create exposure to the industries and the and the educational opportunities that are right in these kids back door. Uh, When we get to high school, that's where the real world experience kicks in. And so if I think I want to be a nurse. Uh, then in high school, we need to be figuring out how to get uh, these high school kids um, real world experience, shadowing a nurse or, or um, uh, going, you know, th- with the work based experience, uh, those types of things. Because I always say this, it's just as important to know what you don't want to do as it is to know what you want to do. Right. So if you think you want to do this and you get into it and you think, oh, my gosh, I, this is 
is not for me. We don't want that to be your junior year in college, right? We want you to be able to have those experiences and figure out what you're really interested in along the way. Um, and then lastly, in post-secondary, that's where we hone our expertise. And that looks different for different people. That can be a community and technical college. It can be an apprenticeship. It can be um, a, a private uh, college uh, or university, or it could be a public university. But regardless of where you end up after high school, that's the time in your life where you've got to become an expert in your field and make sure that you are making yourself indispensable to the workforce so that you are needed uh, throughout your adult life. You've been working with uh, interim Education Commissioner Kevin Brown and the Kentucky Department of Education and uh, local school superintendents and so forth on the opening of can public schools, local school systems for the 2021 uh, uh, academic year. As we do this interview, uh, what are some of the recommendations uh, coming from the state uh, to the local school districts? And I know that what uh, is being said in Jefferson County is different from what uh, may be the case in Taylor County and so on. But uh, in general, what, what are you hearing? What do you think as we do this interview in mid-July? Yeah, and you're exactly right. Every school, I mean, not even every school district is different from building to building. Those those Correct. populations are very different. And so, um, you know, one of the things that we have worked really hard to do, and let me give some credit to uh, Interim Commissioner uh, Kevin Brown. He has done a wonderful job. Talk about somebody who stepped into a role that, uh, <laughs> he, that he didn't realize what was going to hit. He's done a fantastic job and he's been a great partner. Um, but what we've worked to do is to create every flexibility that we can for our school districts and so essentially we have waived statutes um, we have put policies into place that would allow our school districts to operate as best they can that for decisions that fit their community so for instance whether you want to go back full in-person classes uh, whether you want to create a hybrid model where some kids come back on certain days and there's an, there's you alternate or whether you want to go full digital those opportunities are on the table because of the steps that we've taken here at the state level um, to allow our local school districts to be able to make those decisions. Uh, and so we've put out our Healthy at School document that goes through the whole uh, recommendation from the Department of Public Health, masks, social distancing, uh, washing uh, your hands and surfaces, uh, temperature checks, you know, those types of things. And I always tell people we can't change the science. I can't make the virus operate differently. Um, you know, we have no control over that. But what we can do is extend every flexibility possible in the middle of a pandemic to make sure our schools can meet the needs of our, our students and our kids. There is real anxiety out there about returning to school. I feel it. Uh, I hear it. My husband's a teacher. We have a, a one son who's a rising uh, senior uh, in high school, and I have a five-month-old at home. And so it's going to impact our family like it is every other family. And so um, I, I cannot say enough how important it is for our school districts as they create these reopening plans. Number one, to include every perspective of the school community. And I mean even students. Students are the ones that have to come to school. We need to hear what their anxieties are too. Um, but at, at the heart of every reopening plan has to be the health and safety of our kids, are the adults in the building and all of their families. That has to be paramount to anything else. Do, do you think, Lieutenant Governor, that we have uh, advanced on the uh, quality of virtual learning uh, since we had to shut down back in the spring uh, of 2020? So, you know, so I'll tell you this, our school districts the, the work that they did to go from what we viewed as normal to right. turning on a dime and being able to deliver full digital lessons, meals, millions and millions of meals across the Commonwealth um, and and to reach out and, and create this new learning environment overnight right. was remarkable. Um, no teacher would ever tell you that uh, digital learning could replace the person-to-person -person contact of, uh, of a, what we would believe is a normal education right. environment. Uh, but what I will say is uh, we have found new ways, we have been creative and innovative, and we have made the best of a situation that we can't control. Uh, 
and that's really all we can ask of our schools and our families right now is we've got to we've got to come together work together and make the best of a situation that is completely out of our control until we have a vaccine kentucky has a new education commissioner tell us about him Yes, so we just announced our new commissioner uh, last week. His name is Jason Glass. He is a Kentuckian uh, coming to us by way of Colorado. Um, he is currently the superintendent of uh, the Jeffco school system uh, out in Denver, but he grew up in Brandenburg in Kentucky. He um, is a graduate of the University of Kentucky and began his uh, teaching career right here um, in Hazard. So he's got Kentucky roots and uh, we're really excited to, to welcome him back home uh, and to get started and, and figure out how we can move Kentucky forward, even in the middle of the pandemic. We're down to under a minute, about 30 seconds probably. What words of encouragement would you give to young people and to women in particular who are considering getting involved in politics and public service? Go for it. Uh, you know, I, I want to thank um, all of the women that uh, had the guts to run for office before me who helped to blaze the trail so that someone like me could do it. I'm the first sitting lieutenant governor to ever have a child in office. Um, and I know that that would not have been possible had it not been for the sacrifices of the women and the families that came before. Um, and I will tell you, we need more um, perspectives at the table, making decisions for our families. Uh, we need more young moms uh, who it's really hard to run for office or do many things outside of, of your daily um, schedule uh, if you have a young child, but that is so needed today in our policies um, that affect every single Kentuckian. So go for it. Kentucky Lieutenant Governor Jack Willen Coleman, thank you for being our guest today. We wish you well and look forward to future opportunities to sit down and have this discussion, hopefully face to face. Yes. Uh, in the future. Uh, God thank bless you. Dr. Downey. Thank you. Thank uh, you. And the, I'd like to thank our audience for being with us once again for dialogue on public issues. Mm -hmm.